This is the Real Digital Transformation podcast series, empowering technology and business professionals to succeed with digital transformation. Now, here's your host, best-selling author, Thomas Earle. Hi, this is Thomas Earle, and welcome to another episode of the Real Digital Transformation podcast series. Today, I have with me Ryan Breen, CTO of ZMags, and Ryan is here to share with us his insights and his experiences with how digital transformation relates to changes and shapes uh, modern day e-commerce, and in particular, the importance of digital optimization to digital transformation as a whole. It should be a fascinating exploration here. Ryan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Super. Let's begin with that. I, in, in terms of what digital optimization encompasses and how it relates to either the planning or execution of a digital transformation initiative, and then further how it relates to how all that may change how we approach e-commerce and may change the result of what we build in terms of an e-commerce presence Tell us more about um, what you see happening and what you've experienced in that regard. Yeah, what we what we see so much out in the ecosystem right now in e-commerce is everyone is trying to figure out how to differentiate by telling more authentic, unique stories to, to break out of, so many folks refer to it as template jail, this just feeling that you go to an e-commerce site and for those of us who've been in the industry or, or seen a lot of, of e-commerce sites over the years, there's this moment where you feel like you're, you're having a really authentic e-commerce experience. You're being shown a gorgeous campaign and everything's really tailored and there, there's real creative intent there. And then you get a step or two in on your, your journey as a shopper. Now you're in a grid and now you're in a product page and every product page on every site looks kind of the same. And there's that moment where folks say, hey, I'd really like to be able to do something different. I'd really like to see what's working on the parts of my site that 50% of my customers live on or 50% of my customers only land on my product pages. And I can't really tell my story there. My product page doesn't feel like me and I can't test different things. I can't see what's working. I can't optimize it because if it takes you a month to make a simple change or change arrangement, bring a new campaign, bring some new offers, related products, whatever story you want to tell and, and say, is this working for people? Is it not? If it takes you a month to make that decision, an awful lot changes in a month. It's really hard to do data science on that and say, yeah, I'm seeing much better signal. I'm seeing much better user engagement on these pages when who knows what's happened. The world changes in a month. Tightening that loop, getting folks where they say, Man, I can, the speed of thought as quickly as I think of something, I can try new strategies, I can get some data on them, I can see what's working, I can tell my story and not feel like I'm, I'm held back by the limitations of a platform or our sort of pre-modern approach to building and deploying e-commerce applications. So that's where I feel digital transformation, whereas in the past it was a uh, heritage of ZMags, let's help you get your, your catalog online and add some links to it. We're in a different world now, which is I want to tell people authentic stories throughout that entire journey. It's not a catalog. It's about your entire presence being an, an e-commerce application you can iterate on daily. I really like that expression, template jail. It really does um, feel like that sometimes, like you go to different e-commerce environments, different stores, different types of um, uh, portals, and and you feel a sense of deja vu. You know, I've been here before. I've had the same experience. This is just another organization that used another template to to do what they do, and um, and so much of the emphasis in digital transformation is on innovation, especially in relation to enhancing customer centricity to make the customer experience unique, special, better than it was before, and to foster uh, longer term relationships with, with customers rather than just one-off transactions. And so given 
given that uh, status quo of so many sites using templates, but given the objective now of so many organizations that are pursuing um, a presence that uh, aims to make them stand out from their competitors, uh, how do you achieve, how do you optimize the digital experience of, um, of clients, of customers? How do you innovate uh, the front end? You know, you, you mentioned data science. So I'm sure that plays a part. What, what would you recommend organizations do to really try to uh, establish the best possible and least predictable type of uh, customer experience? Oh, I like I like least predictable there. I think that's a, a great goal is to have it feel like a, call it a rewarding surprise when you go to an application and you get deeper into an e-commerce site and it doesn't feel like you've now fallen into a very predictable transactional mode. Oh, I'm on a product page. Now you're trying to tell me something and sell me something. It's, oh, this feels different. I'm learning something about this. You're telling your brand story because maybe you're pulling in content from a blog and you're telling me in a product page something really interesting about what I'm looking at. The It starts with having the tooling and having the processes that allows you to move much, much more quickly. The reason that folks lean on, on templates is that the, the more products you have, the, the richer your product catalog, the harder and harder, to, harder it is for somebody to sit down and really build that authentic journey throughout a site and to say, yeah, if, if you have 10 SKUs, you're a new boutique brand, you get to hand build the most gorgeous and differentiated and unique and special content related to those products. That doesn't scale once you're at a thousand SKUs. And so what's the technology offering that's going to allow you at that scale to say, no, we could do something really different on this class of SKUs, or we could do something dynamic where maybe for 5% of users, I'm going to see what happens if I pull in a wildly different piece of content and do some of that more outlier testing and say, no, I can, I can waste the effort to try something really, really different on these pages, show it to a subset of users and, and see whether that works or not. You have to get to the point where it's near effortless to create new content, to create new, not just campaigns at the, the landing page of your site, but to bring that all the way down to your product pages. So yeah, you know, the last, I'd say know, five, 10 years, the direction of travel has been, cool, we're gonna break out of, of the limitations of a super monolithic tech stack by saying, you know, if we, if we give every developer super expressive front end development toolkit where they can build a headless application, they can sit that on top of the right set of APIs, then they'll have the power and the flexibility to be able to create those truly different journeys throughout the site. And you know, that is not an option that um, you know, we've seen necessarily come to fruition for everyone, where you know, the uh, amount of agility that they wind up happen at the end of it, yes, they're able to create things that are gorgeous and they look different once, but when everything takes development effort to build something really different the next time, we've actually tended to see that it's actually slowed folks down. Yeah, you're not in template jail, but you have even more inertia, even more of a, a high latency hop from creative and business idea to, okay, now let's get that up on a site where I can tell somebody that story. So I think we're still searching for it. I think as a e-commerce ecosystem, we recognize everybody wants to move faster putting developers as the ultimate arbiters of how you can get things live in front of folks. Um, that's a, it's just way too high latency and you can't iterate quickly enough to say, yeah, we're going to take a week of development time to try something for 3% of our audience and see if that really sticks. Right. Interesting. I, um, in, in terms of data science, uh, Cloud AI, AI in general, in relation to digital transformation, is a very, very popular focal point right now. So much so that organizations are, are perhaps jumping on that bandwagon a bit, a bit too quickly and, and um, not thinking through how AI should be utilized within their business. Um, but in terms of 
e-commerce and customer experience, what have you seen so far or, or what, what are your insights as to how a, a business should best utilize AI in, in, in pursuit of improving customer centricity? I am, I am in the wild-eyed tech utopian true believer lunatic fringe on generative AI. I really believe, and, and I think it relates a lot to this notion of being able to create, devise new strategies, new stories, new journeys for customers deep throughout sites. If we turn ourselves as say business users, e-commerce creative, even developers and say, instead of being the ones who are going to generate and create and, and be the ones who write the copy and content and tell new customer stories, if we switch to being editors, if we switch to a mode where we say, no, we're not going to be the first intelligence that's going to come up with new strategies of, of things to try today. We're going to curate, we're going to be able to pluck out the things that, that look the best and tell the most unique story. You can really get down to the point where you're running 20 new, really interesting campaigns for subsets of an audience throughout a site and being able to do that day in and day out and not have it feel like an absolute death march for creative teams being asked to, to produce that much. Um, I bring in, you know, from from my perspective, more as a CTO and working on this from the how do I develop applications these days? Um, you know, three months ago, I really put down a, a mandate with my team and said, look, I want us to take some time where we're not the first ones that put you know, pen to paper or cursor into editor anymore. Give it a shot to ask for help to ask for like, give me that starting point, And then let me chat with you and iterate on it and see kind of where we land. Um, it is such an amazing force multiplier on what you're able to accomplish. And I feel like that's got relevance in e-commerce, content creation and, and business strategies that, that you would bring into play. And I speak of that purely you know, for in this context from the how do I create new strategies? How do I get new content that I can put out there so that we have something to test and, and something to get a signal from, less from the perspective of what do we actually do to, to mine that information and, and make decisions based on it? I, I just think that you can't get to the point where you have enough signal, where you've really tested enough different things if the effort to get new content and strategy and stories on your product pages if that doesn't collapse down enough that you're just happy to waste a bunch of it and try new things and, and really say, no, I could tell a radically different story today, see if it works. And if it does, that's the base of the story that I tell tomorrow. A um, huge part of that is just leaning in to, no, I don't create the content anymore. I curate it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, from a front end um, user interface, customer journey, uh, design perspective um, in today's uh, e-commerce uh, platforms in today's um, digital business markets. Uh, how how has our approach to e-commerce changed because of all this digital technology adoption and all of this focus on digital transformation and the incorporation of um, the, the emphasis on more relationship building rather than transactions. Uh, how has all of this changed how uh, we approach the design of an e-commerce front end today, uh, as opposed to as recent as perhaps three or, or five years ago? How, you know, if you were to start a new business, create a new e-commerce platform for what you're selling um, a few years ago, there there would have been certain cutting edge best practices, technologies we would have put in place. Uh, but now things have accelerated so much. So if if an organization was starting up today with a brand new e-commerce environment that they wanted to put out there and they want to be competitive and disruptive and um, on par with what the, 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 the larger digital uh, enabled organizations are already doing. 
what best practices would you recommend to them? What steps would you suggest they take? But also best practices in terms of how today they could better distinguish themselves using newer innovations, using more modern practices than, again, perhaps just a few years ago. So I think the overall, what would you use is, is the core of your tech stack. If you were starting, if you had the benefit of that third, fourth, fifth mover advantage of starting an e-commerce business now, as opposed to having one that you're trying to modernize that's 15 years old, I still think the core of that platform, I still think headless is a great design approach. I think headless on top of a great headless CMS managing all of the backend API orchestrations that you would want to build a business on top of. Ryan, and- sorry to interrupt. Why don't you quickly, for those who don't know, tell us what you were, are referring to with Headless? Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, so historical monolithic e-commerce applications where I've got a, a tech stack that is a database of my products, and it also generates pages for each of those products. And so there's a really tight coupling between the thing that manages all my data, between the the servers that are going to know about order fulfillment and products and all of the the CMS, the assets, the the, the content and copy that makes up my site. And the thing that actually pushes that out to a website and renders it, it's the same application, really tight coupling there. And that's where you, when we talk about template hell, when we talk about those sites that, that feel very, uh, tied together or feel very limited and they all kind of look the same it tends to be because, yep, you've got a thing sitting on top of a database and it's serving up a bunch of HTML and it's largely been the same approach since call it 1995. With the move towards headless, the notion there is that you are breaking apart the that coupling from what serves up the application, whether it's to a mobile app or, or to, just to a website, you're breaking that apart from everything that sits behind it. So you're saying I could build this really cool expressive app and the most modern development technologies. You see folks building really nice single page apps using the the modern development frameworks like like React, creating a front end application that is separate from all of the back end infrastructure that it sits on top of. And the really interesting thing there also becomes you get a lot more composability. You get a lot more opportunity to say, well, I'm not just stuck with the options that my e-commerce platform provides. If I want to have better personalization, if I want to bring in content from 20 different sources because I got reviews and I got a bunch of other stories that I want to tell on my site, you're now saying I can do truly best in class composition of my e-commerce ecosystem. And so I'm going to use my product catalog maybe for my traditional e-commerce stack, but I'm also going to do order fulfillment and payments and all the other aspects that make up a modern e-commerce business. I'll get to choose who I want to work with and I'll get to do that all while bringing it into an application that, that on the front end from a user experience feels truly custom and handcrafted and differentiated from every other application or or every other e-commerce site that has more of that tight coupling of front end to back end. That's the the premise of Headless. And I do think that it's still an extraordinarily strong premise where we've seen it fall down primarily in the the last three years or so. uh, There are two main drawbacks of it. One is it's really, really hard to get there if you aren't a business that starts right now. And that's why I say, if I'm starting a new company, yeah, I'm definitely going headless. If I'm sitting on top of a business that's humming along and we're making a billion dollars a year, it's a really tough ask right now to say, hey, CIO, I need 18 months to replatform my business because headless is going to be worth it. It's going to solve all of our problems and we're going to feel like a truly unique and, and special application because the the downside, the, the primary one for everyone, whether you're starting a company or whether you are, are trying to replatform to it, is you are incredibly constrained by the availability of, of top tier front end developers who are going to say, yeah, I've got this great SDK. I've got this great set of, of APIs on the back end. 
I can design and build something really cool. And then I'm going to do that for you five times a week because everything is on the plus side, handcrafted and gorgeous. And some developer is, is making it so. And on the downside, all those same things, because there aren't that many developers and there are fewer and, and farther between every day, it seems. And so many folks who've wound up with headless, they say, and now our constraint is we have all this expressive power. It's just really hard to capitalize on it because we've we've hitched ourselves so much to a developer centric model. Interesting. So the a is like a fundamental best practice right now, especially if you're building it up from scratch, is to follow the headless design um, from the get go because that that will help you especially um, have a stand out more as opposed to those that that would still be struggling with adopting that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If, I'm, if I'm starting a new site, I mean, it's just you can build and design so much more differentiated applications than than something that is coming out of a template as long as you have the people to do it, as long as you've really leaned into it and say, no, that's that's our goal. That's our direction. And we're going to have a, a development team capable of capitalizing on that technology. Hmm. Are there other best practices or recommendations you would have beyond that for how we should approach the front end of e-commerce today? Yeah, the biggest, and, and it is related to, you know, you're, you're using headless, but I think the thing that I, I think is most critical and it's more I don't know, the organizational architecture of businesses that are, that are optimizing is what is your workflow going to look like from creative idea, business idea to something that you can actually put in front of, of shoppers. We talk to a, a lot of, of companies where they get so bogged down in really cumbersome handoffs from team to team to team that no matter how expressive the developer toolkit, no matter how wonderful the tech stack you're sitting on top of, if your path from idea to something you can put in front of someone is two weeks worth of meetings between three teams, each of whom is feeling shortchanged or they're feeling like, well, I've got to hand my vision, I've got to hand my 20 years of experience doing my job to somebody else who is going to do part of the solution, that's going to do part of getting that to the site, but it's going to be lossy. There's going to be something they do that's not the same way that I would do it, but we're all waiting on each other. If you're going to go with a really cool tech stack, you're going to go with something that lets you design a, a great site. You need to do so in a way that, that is not breaking your focus on that by pinning it to a legacy uh, organizational and engineering model of Scrum and developer handoffs and, and things that are going to take you weeks when your tech stack does let you take days to get new content out or even minutes. Um, it's organizational structure as much as it is technology choice. Interesting. And and that in itself, if we can change and improve our backend process, that will help the organization also be more agile, especially in volatile digital business markets where often speed to market is uh, is so critical. That's absolutely what we see is mm -hmm. we we see fewer customers complaining about their technology choices and their technology offerings. Even folks who aren't on headless, even folks who aren't on the, the newest, latest and greatest tech stacks, more often than not, when we hear organizations that aren't happy about their ability to, to create differentiated experiences quickly enough to have anything to optimize against, it's about 
having to be so dependent on each other. And I'll hear frequently, probably twice a week, very amicable conversations between the engineering side of the house and the creative business user side of the house, where they're all just wishing they didn't have to work together so much. And it's not that like anybody doesn't like anyone. It's just like, yeah, I'm I'm running e-commerce. Uh, I'm running operations for us. I want to go bring in five new vendors and plug them into the site and do something really interesting. And I got a site to run. And I am not going to be good at taking your design idea, your creative idea, and turning that into HTML and CSS. It's not the thing that I'm best at. And I've got a a creative team that says, I can generate a million ideas a day, but I have to make these debilitating choices about what's the thing that in two weeks, I wish at this moment, I will have told them to build because it's that level of like, I'm not in control of my own destiny. And the engineering team is saying, we hate being a barrier for you. And the creative team is saying, and when we get to that point that we've gotten something over to you, it's not exactly what we asked for. And it's that, I don't know, impedance mismatch within organizations that is more of a a stress point than, wow, I really wish the technology made this effortless. Hmm. That's really uh, enlightening in, in a sense. You know, when I asked you about best practices, for e-commerce front ends, I I was expecting um, you know uh, uh, recommendations as to how to design or use a technology or use this approach or that approach. But uh, your your primary recommendation was to improve how we actually produce it. So organizational optimization leading to digital optimization, um, which I think is is. Uh, very, very um, on the nose right now in terms of what organizations do need to um, improve in order to gain advantages in competitive markets. It's it's the end product, but also how that end product um, is is created, is put together, how they collaborate to do so, and uh, and you know that also could carry us into a conversation about product centric versus customer centric. Um, departments and groups and divisions and how they have to come together, but uh, no, that's actually I I really uh, appreciate that it it uh, helps open um, the eyes of, of organizations who sometimes perhaps are not as much focused on improving how they do it, but more focused on what they should be producing to to stay competitive. Um, the my last question, you know, looking on the reverse side of of that. Uh, what do you see as right now the greatest risks or challenges or pitfalls when it comes to establishing effective uh, e-commerce um, applications, uh, effective front ends? How, what, what mistakes are organizations making um, either through the misuse of digital technology innovations or, or otherwise? And, and what, what type of... Um, recommendations would you give businesses in general as to what to look out for? The biggest thing I I worry about and the biggest thing I I see so many people get tripped up by, and it it relates to this topic of, do you focus on organizational improvement or technology improvement? Any technology is only as good as the organization's ability to harness it. And I see so many folks look to spend a year or two years fixing organizational problems with technology. That next replatform will be the one that solves everything, and then we'll be able to move as as quickly as we want to. And it's tough, particularly in this moment where the economy is uncertain. And at the same time, the economy is uncertain developers are more expensive than they've ever been. And so folks wind up in in a really tricky spot of saying, yeah, we want this replatform because we feel like we're stuck in that template jail. We feel like we're stuck in a, a structure for our application that's just not going to let us realize our dreams. But we can't take 18 months and hire a bunch of folks or go to an agency that, that's going to charge us a million dollars to rebuild everything. 
the focus on big bang replatforms and the next platform being the one that solves your problems, that's the, the trap. That's the biggest thing that I, I see folks having regret when they get in the middle of it, because anything that's a year becomes two years or three years. Mm -hmm. And nobody has time for that right now. So what are the incremental strategies where you could say, no, it doesn't have to be everything all at once. What can we do on this part of our site? What can we do to take this part of that customer journey, make that a little bit better this week and next week? And then in two weeks, we're doing another thing. And in two weeks, we're doing another thing while we chip away at that problem of now we're going to wake up in a year and have the, the site, the e-commerce shopper journey that we've always wanted. But we got there getting value all along the way. It's the we're just going to throw technology at a organizational problem and hope that we wake up in a year and 18 months or whenever it is with control of our destiny. I've just never seen that work. And mm -hmm. it's such an easy trap to fall into because it's what we've always done. Like we'll upgrade to the new OS. We'll upgrade to the new thing. That'll solve everything. Whereas it's like, no, let's let's figure out what you're actually trying to do bit by bit and build your way up to something great as opposed to assuming the next great thing is 18 months away. Hmm. Cool. Super. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, I think this is a much needed um, assessment that organizations need to do uh, in order to ensure that the direction they're going with their digital transformation is is in fact the, the the correct path to take because uh others are doing things differently are trying to stand out um whereas some are not some are comfortable in in their template environment and and um perhaps take their uh, clientele for granted uh, a bit too much as well and then you know maybe have that realization a bit later than they should but um Thank you for your time today. And before we go, Ryan, please tell us more about uh, ZMags and what you do. Sure. So we, in the last year, rolled out what we call Faster Front End. This is our uh, front end as a service platform. So when we talk about the difficulty of having a purely developer-centric model for building a headless front end or getting yourself out of template jail, we believe there's a place for a front end as a service platform for business users so that I as an e-commerce creative, I as VP of e-commerce, if I have an idea for new campaign, but also new PDP, new related product strategies, new personalization that I want to bring in, I should be able to do that. And I should be able to do that working hand in hand with my development teams, not being dependent on them and also not making my development team feel like the bottleneck for me getting new ideas out there. So we want to provide people with a, a front end for headless or traditional applications that's not bound by somebody having to sit down and hammer something into HTML and CSS, mm -hmm. really reduce that bottleneck of somebody saying, nope, I got an idea, now it's live on my site and I can do that 10 times on Cyber Monday safely. And I don't have to, to make those paralyzing choices of what am I going to ask Dev for in a month? Because I know they're busy on other things. Um, it's how do we make it possible for everybody in the organization to take their 20 years of experience, the, the best that they know how to do their jobs and, and get things live to the site, try new content strategies and optimize them. Wow. Interesting. Super. Um, Ryan, thanks again. And hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you for listening. Follow Thomas on LinkedIn 